what does anti-oppression mean? Yeah, so uh, I think that's definitely worth talking about because uh, if people were, say, like to Google anti-oppression, they would probably find a lot of different answers. And, um, you know, this is not a satisfactory answer, but in the realm of social sciences, this is often the case, right? People uh, using multiple definitions for what ends up being a fairly common term. So I love that we're going here to kind of define it from the start. So for me, uh, I, I don't typically turn to the definitions that are often used in, say, anti-oppressive education, which is like a, a field of literature that you might encounter if you do Google the term. But uh, there's... Um, there's a, a guy named Johan Galtung who uh, is considered like the father of peace research. And so for me, uh, anti-oppression really digs into his kind of ideas of violence and peace. And so when I'm talking about anti-oppression, what I'm really talking about is the pursuit of peace. And again, peace does not mean a ceasefire. It doesn't mean like we're all kind of neutral with each other. It's a really active process, uh, pushing back against violence. And again, here, as you might anticipate, violence has something of a different meaning. It doesn't mean like not punching each other in the face. Of course, of course it does encompass that as well. But this really has to do with human potential, right? So, um, and Galtung is very like this. This uh, this work that he he wrote really like uh, I could feel my brain seeping out of my ears for like weeks after reading it. It's like I'm not sure I understand this. And um, but basically, what he's talking about is like we're familiar with the idea that humans have potential, right? And anything that kind of gets in the way of humans realizing their potential right? Uh, if it's avoidable, that is violence, right? So like if, for example, uh, well, the example of somebody punching me in the face, right? So that's harming my body. So that means that I couldn't do something that I may have wanted to do or could otherwise have done. And uh, that interaction wasn't necessary. It didn't have to happen, but it did, right? So it's when something is avoidable and it limits uh, the human potential that it is construed as violence. And so we see this on a larger scale, on greater than an interpersonal scale, in what we call structural violence. So like when there are norms, standards, laws, policies that prevent people from becoming what they could become, like healthy, engaged, emotionally healthy people who are connected their com to their community, are productive, uh, you know, all, all these, these positive things, well, then that means, like, there's a system in place that is, is preventing them from doing so. So, like, a classic example is, say, redlining, if people are familiar with that, right? So uh, if people can't buy a home, if they're, if they're forced to live in these uh, not-great places uh, and to rent for their whole lives, well, that prevents them from participating fully in the systems that uh, compose American society. And we've seen that those effects have lasted for generations, like many decades, right? So that is, that's definitely an example of structural violence.